Hello. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, my friend and colleague, <clears throat> Alexander Morea Almeida, for inviting me to be part of this symposium and the chance, the luxury, really, of being able to take a step back and talk about where the science of uh, spirituality and health has been and where it's heading. In the last 40 years, our field has, has witnessed a, a remarkable surge of growth. And the central point I'd like to make in this talk is that I think the field is now moving from research to practice, from a field that emphasized basic research questions in the past to one that is now becoming an evidence-based field. Um, that integrates research with practice. <clears throat> I'll consider some of the progress we've begun to make and some of the challenges as we move forward in this direction. I am taking a bird's eye view here and speaking very broadly, but let me suggest that we've been through a few waves of progress in the domain of religion, spirituality, and health. The first wave of progress grew out of empirical studies documenting the fact that religion, spirituality, and health are interconnected. This first wave then has demonstrated the connectedness of religion, spirituality, and health and well being. The best illustration comes from Harold Koenig's documentation of these links in his handbook of religion and health. And you can see these are a number of the correlates of religious involvement, full range of correlates in terms of mental health status. Now, these fundamental facts uh, that have emerged from the science were surprising to many people, but difficult to refute. And I, I think they helped to convince uh, many formerly skeptical scientists and practitioners of the importance of spirituality to health and well being. But in spite of that success, well, I'd say that this first wave has pretty much run its course. Although these studies demonstrate a religion and health connection, they rely on global measures of religiousness including religious denomination, self ratings of religiousness, frequency of congregational attendance, frequency of prayer, and religious commitment. But knowing that um, a general measure of religiousness is tied to health really doesn't tell us what it is about religion that makes a difference. After all, people can pray for many reasons. People can attend the congregation for many reasons. The question remains, what is it about religion that accounts for the religion and health connection? And this is a significant limitation. And because of it, it's really no longer easy to publish a paper that simply documents the correlations between religion, spirituality, and health. We've entered then a second wave of progress in the field and one that's still underway. In the second wave, we move closer to religious and spiritual life, by focusing more specifically on what it is about religion and spirituality that affect health and well being. How do we explain the connection? Some of this research focuses on more specific religious and spiritual beliefs and practices and experiences, such as uh, feelings of connectedness to God or the sacred, beliefs about life after death, religious and spiritual coping, religious support, involvement in religious rituals, conversion, mystical experiences, and religious and spiritual struggles, which we'll talk about in more detail in a few minutes. We've also seen a growing distinction between studies of religiousness and studies of spirituality, with many 
um, many uh, studies of spiritual variables, such as spiritual growth and spiritual well-being and spiritual intimacy, sanctification, now increasing in frequency. Other studies are identifying and examining mediating and moderating variables that may account, account in part for the religion and health connection. For example, emotional comfort, social connectedness, meaning in life, impulse control, better health practices, and virtues such as forgiveness, humility, gratitude, and hope could account for the effects of religion on health and uh, well being. And we shouldn't forget the sense of transcendence in the sense of being connected to something larger than oneself or deeper within oneself could also help explain why religion and health seem to be connected to each other. The findings from this research, this second wave of research, have begun to point to what it is about religion and health that makes a difference, religion that makes a difference for health. These are important findings, um, and they're more of scientific, they're more of uh, more than of scientific interest. They hold important practical implications too. Let me give one example from research that's recently grown on the phenomena of spiritual struggles. And if you're interested in this, this work, I uh, will uh, make a little plug for my forthcoming book with Julie Exline entitled Working with Spiritual Struggles in Psychotherapy from Research to Practice. We define spiritual struggles as experiences of tension, conflict, or strain that center around whatever people view as sacred, center around sacred matters. Julie Exlin and I have delineated six types of spiritual struggle through our research. One involves struggles with the divine, with however the divine may be understood. Another involves struggles with the demonic or evil forces. Then there are struggles with other people over sacred matters. Struggles with moral issues between our higher morality and our impulses. Doubt related struggles over the truths of religious beliefs. And ultimate meaning struggles involving questions about whether one's life or life in general has a higher purpose. Here's an example of a divine struggle. And this came from one of my undergraduate students dealing with bipolar illness. And she wrote this to me in an email. She said, I'm suffering, really suffering. My illness is tearing me down and I'm angry at God for not rescuing me. I mean, really setting me free from my mental bondage. I've been dealing with these issues for 10 years now and I'm only 24. I don't understand why he keeps lifting me up just to let me come crashing down again. We think of struggles as in-between phenomena. They lie in between belief and unbelief, in between meaningfulness and meaninglessness, in between connection and disconnection, in between morality and impulsivity, in between security and insecurity, in between good and evil. And maybe because they lie in the, the cracks and the crevices of human experience, spiritual struggles hadn't received a great deal of direct attention until recently. But the pictures changed. Now literally hundreds of studies of spiritual struggles have been conducted. And we're learning a, a number of things. For one, they're not at all unusual. They can be found among all demographic groups within every religious tradition, across diverse cultures, among the most and the least devout, including atheists and agnostics, and among healthy people, as well as those facing medical and psychological problems. Here's an example of a study of uh, patients with advanced cancer, and 58% overall endorsed a spiritual struggle. More specifically, 30% were wondering why God had allowed their cancer to happen. 
29% wondered whether they had been abandoned by God. 25% felt angry at God, and so on. We're also learning that spiritual struggles have important implications for health and well-being. In one study of a representative sample in the United States, all types of spiritual struggle were tied to greater depression, anxiety, and lower life satisfaction and happiness after controlling for several other variables. Other studies have tied spiritual struggles to a full range of psychological and physical problems, including greater risk of mortality and suicidality. Let me give you one example that uh, my friend and colleague, Harold Koenig and I conducted uh, a number of years ago. This is a two-year longitudinal study in which we tied spiritual struggles to higher risk of psychological decline, physical decline, and most notably, greater risk of mortality. Um, and even after we're entering in a number of controls into the equation. In, in particular, the risk of mortality was predicted by feelings of abandonment by God. This was really the first study of its kind to document how certain kinds of spirituality can increase the risk of mortality. The findings from this literature are robust. Um, they've been uh, demonstrated among men and women, uh, diverse ethnicities across a lifespan, people dealing with diverse life stressors, people from diverse religious affiliations, and people from diverse cultural contexts, including the US, Brazil, Poland, Iran, Israel, South Africa, Chile, and Ukraine. I should add that in a recent meta-analysis of 32 longitudinal, st longitudinal studies of spiritual struggles predicting change in mental health status, struggles were associated with declines in mental health after controlling for baseline mental health. And these findings uh, provide support for the, the primary role of struggles as a contributor to poor mental health. Again, I, I want to stress that this research is more than a theoretical or scientific interest. It has important clinical implications, and it really suggests we can ill afford to overlook spiritual struggles in our clinical work. So this second wave of studies, of which this is only one uh, set, really have created the stage for a third wave in the domain of the science of spirituality and health. And this is a wave in which we uh, envision our science as an applied field, an applied science, an applied discipline. Here we're moving from research to evidence-based practice. Let me just uh, trend, uh, let me, take a step back from this for a second and just note that um, the trajectory of my own career provides an example of this movement across these three waves. When I, I first started out in my own career, I, I really had a disconnect between my research and my practice as a clinical psychologist. Um, four days a week, I worked at my university as an academic clinical psychologist and professor and one day a week, I saw my cases in practice. But my academic researcher colleagues didn't know anything about my clinical side. And my clinical colleagues didn't know anything about my academic side. They didn't know anything about my research in particular in the psychology of religion. And the reality was that my clinical work really had little to do with my research. And the disconnect was due in part to the fact that I was doing wave one level research at that time. I was looking at the relationship between general measures of religiousness uh, with measures of mental health. And sure, I was able to show significant relationships between the two, but the findings didn't have direct relevance to clinical work with specific clients facing specific problems. <clears throat> uh, 
So I began to move to wave two research, taking a closer look at specific forms of religiousness and their implications for mental health. In my clinical work, I found it useful to ask my clients whether they drew on their faith as a resource to them in coping with the problems they brought to treatment. And I also found it useful to ask them how their problems might have affected them spiritually, which sometimes opened the door to conversations about spiritual struggles. So drawing on the words of of my clients themselves, we developed a measure of religious coping in 1998 that's still used in the field today. <clears throat> and we began to identify specific religious expressions that may facilitate or at times impede mental health, including spiritual struggles. This wave two research then had direct implications for clinical practice. So about 20 years ago, I began to shift to wave three study, focusing on how spirituality can be more fully integrated into treatment. And I wrote a book on spiritually integrated psychotherapy, building on both wave one and wave two research. I share my story here only as one illustration as to how the field has moved from a disconnection of research and practice to the integration of research and practice. Um, and there are many other stories and illustrations. In 2013, I was privileged to serve as chief editor of the American Psychological Association's Handbook of Psychology, Religion, and Spirituality. Excuse me. <coughs> the overarching theme of the APA Handbook is the integration of research and practice. The first volume focused on research studies with an eye toward their practical implications. <clears throat> and the second uh, volume focused on presentations of evidence-based applications in the field. Several chapters documented the progress of evidence-based care with a variety of um, problems, depression, illness, um, severe mental disorder, sexual trauma, eating disorders, and so on. <clears throat> Several other chapters focused on the nuts and bolts of addressing spirituality in various settings, including correctional settings, military settings, the workplace, uh, educational settings, and the healthcare system. Let me now just focus on some of the exciting work that's representing this key third wave of, of, of research and practice in the field and illustrate the ways in which research and practice are now being integrated. These studies address some really important questions. One question is whether spiritually integrated interventions are in fact effective. Although research relevant to this question is still in its early stages, the findings suggest that spiritually integrated treatments are more effective than control conditions and at least as effective as other secular treatments. <clears throat> in some cases, spiritually integrated treatments have outperformed secular therapies. For instance, uh, Scott Richards and his colleagues studied women with eating disorders in an inpatient clinic and compared the effectiveness of a spiritually integrated group with cognitive behavioral treatment and an emotional support group. All three groups showed positive changes over the course of treatment, but the spiritual group manifested more improvement in terms of eating attitudes, symptom distress, social role conflict, and spiritual well being. Another important question is whether spirituality adds a distinctive benefit to traditional treatments. Amy, Amy Wachholz conducted a study that speaks to this point. She was interested in whether or not a spiritual mantra adds something of extra value to the meditative process over secular mantras. Now, remember, most meditation practitioners 
have stressed that the content of a mantra doesn't matter as long as it's meaningful to the individual. Amy wondered whether the content counts and would a spiritual mantra add some value to meditation. She worked with students with vascular headaches and assigned them to one of four groups randomly, a spiritual meditation group in which they meditated to a phrase such as God is peace, an internally focused secular meditation group, which they meditated to a phrase such as I'm content, an externally focused secular meditation group in which they meditated to a phrase such as grass is green, and a progressive muscle relaxation group. They practiced the meditative technique for um, 20 minutes a day for four weeks. And she found significant changes to the advantage of the spiritual meditators. For instance, if you look at the solid red line, that's a spiritual meditation group. They experienced a significantly greater decline in headaches <coughs> in comparison to the other three groups. Excuse me. In terms of pain tolerance through the cold presser task in which participants are asked to hold their hands in ice water, and it's, it's quite painful, the spiritual meditators kept their hands in the ice water twice as long on average. And we've also learned made significantly less use of analgesic medication. This study, which has now been replicated, indicates that the spiritual element of, um, of meditation adds to its effectiveness and can be accessed in a, a simple and straightforward way in clinical contexts. Another question, are spiritually integrated treatments helpful for intractable conditions? Some studies have shown that may be the case. A nice example comes from the work of Arthur Margolin, who developed spiritual self schema theory. I'm sorry, spiritual self schema therapy, 3S uh, therapy for short. This is an approach based on cognitive psychology and Buddhist principles and is designed to help treatment resistant heroin users activate their spiritual schema and deactivate their addict self schema. And in a controlled trial, they found that 3S therapy led to significant increases in um, a spiritual self schema and sustained reductions in drug use as measured by drug-free urine screens and tests. <clears throat> then it's important to consider whether spiritually integrated interventions can be helpful to people facing spiritual problems, such as spiritual struggles. And initial studies have shown this may indeed be the case. One comes from a program entitled Winding Road. This is a six week group based counseling program designed to help spiritual strugglers find support for and work through their spiritual struggles. The, the program involves activities such as writing and sharing a spiritual autobiography, uh, sharing their spiritual struggles, um, writing a group lament to God, um, and visualizing and receiving counsel from one's older idealized spiritual self. Very interesting program. It proved to be effective in reducing spiritual struggles, negative affect, developing better self-control and experiencing greater uh, acceptance from God, as well as less stigma in relationship to the struggles. Another important question is whether these struggles, struggle, I'm sorry, whether spiritually integrated interventions can be tailored to um, specific groups. And that in fact has been done. Um, uh, for example, the work of uh, Michelle Pierce and Harold Koenig in which they've designed uh, uh, spiritually integrated treatments for uh, people from a variety of religious traditions uh, working from a cognitive behavioral perspective. Other treatment programs can be applied to people who have non-traditional spiritual orientations. 
For instance, the work of Nicole Murray Swank. Uh, Murray Swank developed a program for women who had been sexually abused um, by various figures, including clergy. These women were no longer able to count on support from their religious institutions, and they were unable to access uh, support from a traditional notion of a male divine being. So she addressed their spiritual injuries in part by drawing on non-male and less threatening ways of envisioning God. For instance, she developed this imagery of God as a waterfall. And in it, she says to the participants, picture God as a waterfall within you, pouring down, refreshing water, the waters of love, healing, restoration throughout your body, renewing, refreshing, restoring. <clears throat> then I think it's important to ask whether we can think outside of the box and extend spiritually integrated interventions uh, in new and imaginative ways. And here are just a few examples of the progress we're making. One comes from work by David Rosmarin. <laughs> he implemented a novel spiritually integrated internet-based uh, treatment for subclinical anxiety among uh, individuals, individuals in the Jewish community. I want to stress that this entire program, uh, as well as the completion of the pre, post, and follow-up measures, was completed online. The two-week program drew on classic Jewish sources to facilitate trust in God among participants. And participants in the spiritually integrated treatment showed greater improvement overall than those in progressive muscle relaxation in awaiting this control group in terms of stress, worry, and spiritual well-being. And I'd add that this kind of program seems especially well-suited uh, to the age of COVID-19 and, and quarantine. Another example of thinking outside of the box is research by Frank Fincham. He studied the effects of spiritually, of, of prayer on infidelity among couples in romantic relationships. And they found that couples who prayed for each other were less likely to engage in infidelity, physical and uh, emotional. These effects were stronger than the effects of undirected prayer and thinking positively about one's partner and the effects were mediated by perceptions that the relationship was sacred. So, Praying for one's partner seemed to enhance feelings of the sacredness of one's relationship. We're just entering this third wave, but I hope you see that there are now signs of an important shift underway in the field. <clears throat> Even so, questions continue to far outnumber um, answers. It, as we move further though, toward the integration of science and practice, I think we're gonna to need to make progress in several areas. Let me just uh, briefly list that. We're gonna need more randomized clinical trials to attest the effectiveness of spiritually integrated treatments. We'll need to test the value added benefits of spiritually integrated treatments over other traditional treatments as Amy Wachholz did. We'll need to design and test treatments tailored to specific religious groups facing diverse problems from diverse cultures. We'll need to test the impact of specific spiritual resources on patients to learn what it is about spiritual life that may be especially helpful to patients dealing with mental health issues. <laughs> We'll need to make further progress in evaluating the effectiveness of interventions for people with spiritual problems, including spiritual strugglers. And again, thinking outside of the box, I think we can imagine spiritually integrated preventive programs, programs to people before they develop serious 
problems in living and develop and evaluate these preventive programs. The future of the field is bright, uh, but it's also challenging. And let me just note a few of those challenges that we'll continue to face before I conclude. One challenge. It's hard to find anyone who is neutral about spirituality and religion. And that includes those who've disengaged from these fears, among them uh, scientists and practitioners. And newcomers to this area of study will need to be aware of the tremendous emotionality of the field. And they should be ready to face misunderstanding, stereotypes, and strong reactions among not only the general public, but also fellow practitioners, researchers, and healthcare professionals. To work effectively in this area, um, researchers and practitioners will need to cultivate a, an exquisite sensitivity to the place of religion and spirituality in people's lives. <clears throat> it's especially important to remember that for many people, religion and spirituality are not simply ways to attain greater health and well being. They're values in and of themselves, values of profound significance that can supersede all other goals. In moving from research to practice, we'll have to grapple with the complexities of religious and spiritual life, some of which we've seen here. So the ability to tolerate ambiguity may be a prerequisite for people entering this field. Because this area is so rich and complex, I strongly encourage people to work in pluralistic, multidisciplinary teams of the kind that I know Alexander Moreira Almeida has developed. Few of us have all of the tools and resources we need to be effective in this area. But respect, I think respectful collaboration with others inside and outside of our own disciplines, including clergy and religious leaders, through that interaction, I think we can address our own biases and limitations and multiply our own resources and support each other through the process. Finally, there's a clear and compelling need for training of researchers and practitioners. Remember, most mental health pr practitioners have virtually no education in this area, it's particularly true for psychology, my field. Uh, Cassandra Veaton has been doing important work in delineating the religious and spiritual competencies that we should use as a basis for training in spiritually integrated practice. Here are some illustrative competencies. An attitudinally based competence. Demonstrate empathy, respect, and appreciation for clients from diverse spiritual, religious, and secular backgrounds. A knowledge-based competence. Identify religious and spiritual experiences, practices, and beliefs that may positively or negatively affect mental health. A skill-based competence can identify and address spiritual and or religious problems in practice and make referrals when necessary. Michelle Pierce and I have been able to develop and evaluate an online training program to foster spiritual competencies among mental health professionals. And we were able to demonstrate significant improvements in knowledge, skills, and attitudes among our program participants over the course of training. These are then significant, there are then significant challenge, challenges as our field moves from research to practice. None of these challenges though is insurmountable. Uh, this is a really exciting time for our field as we move toward the integration of research and practice further into this third wave. Let me conclude with this sentiment. So let me conclude. Certainly there are significant challenges as our field moves from research to practice, but none of these challenges is insurmountable. This is an exciting time in our field as we move toward the integration of research and, and practice. And I, I feel honored 
to be able to be a part of it. Let me conclude with this sentiment. An evidence-based approach to religion and spirituality has the potential to illuminate, broaden, and deepen our approach to healthcare. More systematic attention to the spiritual dimension can only enrich and vitalize our efforts to enhance the human condition. Without that, both our science and our practice will remain incomplete. Obrigado.